Amen. It's good to be together this evening. If we'd stop right now, it would uh, already be an encouraging, worthwhile our time to be together. Singing praises to God, our great I Am, and singing about that heavenly sunlight that fills our souls. No day, doubt the sunlight that we saw today, just a beautiful day, give glory to God, and it is a foretaste, no doubt, of the beautiful rapture to come when we uh, are able to be together in heaven for eternity. I'm so thankful that you had the interest to be out here on a, on a Monday evening, uh, this fall, cool evening, and uh, certainly so many things you could be doing, but uh, you have come here to hear God's Word proclaimed, and that's encouraging to me, and I uh, hope that this evening will also be encouraging to you as well. You know, our view of marriage and the family is certainly under attack. I don't have to tell you that. And I hope that our view of marriage and family is based upon what the Word of God says. Our culture has experienced a massive moral revolution uh, concerning the nature and even the meaning uh, of marriage. If you think about it, 16 years ago, same-sex marriage was illegal in every state of the nation. Eight years later, in 2015, same-sex marriage became a constitutional right in all 50 states. And that's a massive amount of change in just a, a very short time. And it's easy to look at that and think to ourselves, we came a long way in a very short amount of, uh, of time. But it'd be a mistake to think that our culture's digression uh, in their views towards marriage began back in 2016 with the decision from the Supreme Court. Same-sex marriage is not the cause of our times, it is the sign of our times. Our culture long ago embraced the sexual revolution of the 1960s and the 1970s. Our culture long ago succumbed to the, to the idolatry of sex and the diminishing marriage. We are saddened by the way marriages have turned out in our country today. We're saddened how many have ended as well. That The divorce rates continue to climb and, and the number of people who are living together increases without being married. But I want you to understand this did not happen overnight. In 1970 in California, Governor Ronald Reagan signed into the law the practice of no-fault divorces. And within time, every, every state followed suit very quickly. And so we have accepted the idea that we can change spouses like we can change socks. And we lament over everything that has happened in our country. But I want you to understand that our cult country, culture's demise of marriage did not begin with a Supreme Court decision. It is something that is a slide that has been happening for a long time. And yet the Bible's testimony about the meaning and nature of marriage stands in stark contrast to that of our culture. My focus this evening in our lesson is not going to be on what is wrong with the world. We understand they do not view marriage from a godly standpoint. But rather, my focus this evening needs to be on what is right with us as Christians and our Christian marriages. It's easy to look at the world, isn't it? And to say that they don't view marriage in the right way, that they're not following God in any way, that marriages are crumbling around us. And it is a sad state of our country to look at that. But it's even sadder to know that this country is filled with pews in church, church buildings across this nation that are filled with people thinking about matters of marriage that is not much different from the world around us. There has to be more to marriage than what the world alleges. And Ephesians chapter 5 confirms that there is. And I'd like for you to take out your Bibles this evening and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be looking at this evening, where we see that God's glory is at stake in marriage and in the roles that God has assigned for husbands and wives to fulfill. And so this evening, I want us to talk about these God-given roles in marriage. Because again, it is so easy for us to say, this is what we ought to do, be doing about marriage. This is what marriage is. And this is when it is wrong to divorce. And this is when it is wrong to remarry. And we understand that we need to get those things down. But brethren, just staying married is not the goal. The goal is to have a God-glorifying marriage. 
And we are no better off than the world if our marriages do not glorify God, if even behind closed doors we are not what we need to be as husbands and wives to one another. So I want us to look at this passage in Ephesians chapter 5 this evening. And I want to start as Paul does in this particular passage. And in verse 21, speaking of, or verse 22, speaking of the wife's role within marriage. And in verse 22 of this passage, Paul begins this discussion of marriage by saying, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard, and if you'll notice on the overhead, uh, that the word be subject, or the phrase be subject is one word in Greek, is in brackets there. And if you're looking in your Bible, yours may be italicized. And when you see those italicized words, what, it, what that means in your text is that's not in the original language. It's not in the original Greek language there, that word be subject. It simply reads in verse 22, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. But I do want you to understand that this verse carries over from the previous verse in verse 21 that says to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And I believe the principle here is that all Christians within the church need to be subject to one another, to themselves. In other words, I'm to be subject to you in matters, and you're to be subject to me, that, that we all need to serve one another. We all need to put one another's interests before our own. That is a, a general command within the church. It's not speaking of marriage specifically per se. But then more specifically, now as we get to verse 22, he literally says, and wives to your own husbands. And so the thought is carried over that, that congregation, within the congregation, we need to be subject to one another. And guess what? Wives also need to be subject to their own husbands. Now, the word subject here that's used is a military term, and it refers to making someone in a subordinate position. And so be subject to someone means that they are to submit to an authority. It's a word that denotes submission and obedience to a leader. And so, verse 22, Paul says that the proper authority for a wife is her own husband. But I want you to notice what it doesn't say here. Paul could have said, husbands, subject your wives to yourselves. In other words, husbands, it's your role to get your wives under the control Paul might have spoken in such a way that he called on husbands to compel or to coerce submission from their wives. And if you think about it, such a command like that would not be unheard of in a patriarchal society that they lived in. But that's not how Paul talks about here. He, he addresses wives and he says, be subject in the passive voice. And what that means is that wives are called on to voluntarily submit to their husbands. In other words, the responsibility falls upon wives to subject themselves, not for the husbands to make them submit. Husbands, if you ever find yourselves trying to force your wife to be under your leadership, then you need to know that there's a problem. And that's especially true if that case is a pattern over the years of your marriage. You need to be asking yourself, why isn't she following me? Now, the answer may be that she's in rebellion against God, that she's not obeying this, this command here in this verse, and that, he's not follow, that she's not following what God has given her in her role in marriage. And that's possible. And if that is the case, then you can pray for her. You can tenderly encourage her to change. But let me tell you this. Far more often, the reason she's not following you is because you're a crummy leader. And when that is the case, you need to up your game as a leader. Uh, but you're never to coerce, and you're never to manipulate submission. Obviously, you would never physically coerce or, 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 or your wife into anything, but neither can you be verbally abusive or manipulative, manipulative in order to get your way. And if you have to verbally and emotionally intimidate your wife into submission, the problem's not with her problems with you, and you need to repent. But wives, what this does mean is that the responsibility to submit to your husband, to the Lord, falls on you. And that's even if your husband is a crummy leader. You may say, well, my husband's not a leader at all. He doesn't have a backbone. Um, chances are you probably knew that before you married him. 
But regardless, even if he has become a wimpy person over time, and he's not the leader that God intends for him to be, that doesn't mean that you can step up and be the leader. It still means that you must follow in your God-given roles, and you are to submit to him. As a wife, you're not to submit to every man, just to one. It says, to your own husband. So the question is, how does that look? And God calls you to submit to your husband here. And he says, here's how it looks. You submit to your husbands as to the Lord. What that means is that you need to view your submission to your husband as part of your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the way in which you submit to the Lord is how you're to submit to your husband here upon earth, whom he has given as a leadership role within the home. Wives, the narrow road that leads to the life is the path of submission. And what each one of you need to ask yourself is, do I submit myself to the husband, to my husband, as I do, or at least as I should, to the Lord? And you have to be honest with yourself as you ask that and look deeply into your soul. Now, Paul explains why a wife ought to submit to her husband's leadership in verse 23. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. It's interesting that our culture, I believe, uh, treats leadership in marriage much like it's a, a jump ball in basketball. Uh, you know, when there is a question over who has the possession of the ball, maybe both players get their hands on the ball. The referee says it's jump ball. And they go to the middle of the court and they throw the ball up. And the referee tosses this ball up. And whoever's bigger, whoever's stronger, whoever's quicker, whoever's more aggressive ends up getting the ball and has possession. Well, that's not how God appoints leadership in marriage. Leadership in marriage is more like an inbound pass. The referee has already assigned the possession of the ball before it's thrown into play. In marriage, God has handed the ball of leadership to the husband, and he is to lead. We don't get to fight for it, and we don't get to declare it otherwise. We can't decide in our own individual marriages that she is going to be the leader in this particular home, that we're going to take on her last name, and she is going to be the one who leads us. God says, no, that's not the way it's done. And if you're going to follow a God-glorifying marriage, then you're going to have to do it my way, God says. And so this verse says that the husband is the head of the wife, which means that he is the authority. And the husband's leadership is patterned after Christ's headship of the church, that he is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now, what is that like? How is Christ the head of the church? Well, if you go back a few chapters in chapter 1 and verse 22, it says that God put all things, all things in subjection under his Jesus' feet and gave Jesus as head over all things to the church. So obviously headship here has to do with authority. Jesus has all authority in the church. And so in this way, the husband is called to be the leader and the authority in the home. But the question is, are there limits? Are, are there limits to a wife's obligation for her to follow her husband's leadership? Look at what verse 24 of our text says. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands, notice, in everything. Now, this verse has scared a lot of people over the years. Does it really mean that a wife has to submit to her husband in everything? Well, that's what Paul says, yes. And the analogy, however, between Christ and the husbands, we understand, though, is not a perfect one, is it? All analogies break down if you press them too far. And what I mean by that is that Christ is sinless. Christ is perfect. Your husband is not. But don't say amen right there. That's not, that's not what you want to do. But Christ will never lead his bride into sin. We wish that the same could be said for all husbands, but we know better. Sometimes husbands abuse their authority. Christ never will do that. And so for this reason, wives are not to submit to anything that is sin. 
There is no authority on this earth that is absolute authority. Not even a husband's authority. When, when submitting to a husband requires submitting to something that is sinful, then the Christian wife must follow the example of Peter and the apostles. Remember in Acts chapter 5, when the government authority over them told them that you're no longer to go out and preach in the name of Jesus. You cannot do that any longer. Peter and John's response in verse 29 was, we must obey God rather than man. And there may be a case in which a husband might say, you can no longer worship with that church, for example. You can no longer do this that is right. Or, worse yet, maybe I want you to go steal something for me. I want you to do something ungodly. That is when the wife then, of course, must say, I must obey God rather than man. We understand that. In other words, she cannot submit to sin. So why then does Paul use such expansive language in verse 24 that she must submit in everything? Because God does intend for wives to orient their whole lives and all their plans around the leaderships of their husband. They were created to be helpers for their husbands. My wife knows my heart. My wife knows my vision for our home and for raising our children. And so submission for Alina means trying to order the household around the vision that I have for our home even when I'm not at home, she is to carry out that mission. And there's a happy respect there that ought to be pervasive in everything that she does. That doesn't mean that it's always easy for her to do that. In fact, it doesn't even mean that she always agrees with everything that I do uh, and that, I, that I've set up for our home. And, and it doesn't mean that I'm always right. But right or wrong, she should always aim to, to support my leadership. And thank God that she does. So with these things in mind, we ask the question, what does subjecting yourself to your husband in everything as to the Lord, what does that involve? And, and I suppose if I had to sum it up, I would say it this way, that, that submission is about encouraging someone to lead and then following their leadership. It means to support and to respect and, and to work with your leader. And in this case, it's your husband. So what does that involve? How do you apply that as a wife? Let me give you just a few practical examples or suggestions this evening. First of all, I would say that it involves treating your husband with respect. You know, later on in this passage down in verse 33, it says the wife must see to it that, that she respects her husband. Before this, it actually says the husband must love his wife and the wife must respect her husband. Someone has said that, that that's really the deepest need of a husband and a wife, that, that a man, that a woman rather, wants to be loved, and a man really, at the deep, deepest part of it, wants to be respected. That's what he desires. And so it, it, it means that, that the woman must give that honor and respect to her husband. It means not correcting your husband publicly and then shaming him in any way. In Proverbs 31, in verse 12, the virtuous woman does him, her husband, good and not evil all the days of her life. That she is trying to lift him up. She is talking about his good points to others. And let me tell you why. Sometimes that's going to be hard, isn't it? Sometimes it's going to be hard to think of good things about your husband, to speak of. But you're to be his cheerleader. You're to be his helper, not his critic. And I cringe every time I hear a wife putting her husband down, even jokingly, I understand. But is that what the church would do to her leader, Christ? We are to respect them. Remember, as, as the church is submissive to Christ. Let me suggest to you that, that, that submitting to your husband means sharing your feelings without attacking. Wives, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when you attack your husband... It usually it just makes him more defensive, and it probably causes him to withdraw. That's generally what we do. We become angry and settled, and when we feel attacked, we just want to walk away. We don't want to be a part of this anymore. I'm not saying that's right, but generally that is our reaction. Turning to us for help is better than attacking us. We want to rescue. We, by nature, as men, want to defend 
It, it is our natural response to want to fight when attacked. That's a natural instinct that God has given us. So don't tell your husband that, that he's insensitive for not taking out the garbage. That's not the way that you deal with it. That's an attack. Ask him if he would help maybe by taking out the garbage. A loving leader certainly would consider your needs and do it if he's able. And if he's not, don't become angry. Don't complain. Don't nag. And don't even let resentment grow within you. Again, remember, as church is to Christ. Let me also suggest that you don't replay failures that he has done in the past. You've probably heard the story of two men who are talking about their uh, controversies with their wives while they're at work on break. And he says, yeah, every time that I get in an argument with my wife, she gets historical. And the man said, what, you mean hysterical? He said, no, historical. She just keeps bringing up stuff from the past that I've done over and over and over again. Again, unlike Christ, us men, we make mistakes, but not all men want to hear about the mistakes they've made. We have the desire, the drive to be successful. So underscore what your husband does well rather than to point out what he does badly. And when the opportunity arises, and by the way, timing is everything with your husband, help him to correct his error in a submissive way. Again, you're his helper. You're to help him in his weaknesses. Let me give you one other suggestion, and that is to reinforce positive behavior. I know that almost sounds like you're raising children, doesn't it? But in many ways, that's the way that we have to react to our husbands, that there's nothing that a man wants to hear more than the good job that he's doing when he is. And that may be, in fact, one of our major needs, one of our most uh, maybe close to our number one need, to say thank you to your husband when he opens the door for you. Thank him when he stands to give you his seat. Encourage courtesy and kindness by applauding it. When, when you see that, when you see him taking out the trash without you asking, when he corrects his errors, and, and let us know when we're doing something right. Ladies, this is just a few suggestions that manifest, I think, the scriptural idea of submission. But before I leave the wives, the subject of the wives here, let me ask the question, what, what if a wife is married to a man who's not taking the lead? A husband who is just letting things go, who doesn't support his family, who's not leading his family, his wife and children spiritually, who doesn't discipline the children, who's spineless, who does not take responsibility. Again, submissiveness does not resort to taking leadership in those circumstances. However, as a helper for the husband, she must submissively help him to reach his potential. It's not through nagging, but maybe in some of the ways that we discussed just a moment ago. I understand there may come a point in your marriage where the husband completely shirks all of his responsibilities. And when that's the case, I do believe that a, a woman can step in in some areas and make sure that those responsibilities are mean, being met. I think Abigail is a great example of that in 1 Samuel chapter 25. But she can't become the leader. She can't start making the decisions for the family. She also cannot go against his leadership decisions that he has made. And I think Peter gives us this advice to, to those wives whose husbands were not what they needed to be in 1 Peter chapter 3. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands that even with, uh, if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. Now, I recognize this is probably talking about husbands who aren't even Christians at all, but how much more so to maybe husbands who are Christians, but just aren't living the way they ought to. You can change them by your godly example as they observe that. The greatest way that a wife can make a difference in her husband is not by lecturing him, by simply showing him Christ in your life. Wives, Sometimes submission is difficult. And you say, Jonathan, well, that's easy for you to say. You're a man, right? How would you know? Well, of course, I've never been a wife. I never will be a wife. But I have to submit to other authorities. And the fact is, I submit to some authorities that sometimes I don't feel like are making the best decisions. I have to submit to authorities that I don't agree with the decisions they've made, not necessarily that they're sinful. 
but that's a part of life. We all have to submit. And, and the difficulty is not always because your husband is being abusive or asking you to do something that is sinful. It may just be because he's doing something that you believe is unwise, or maybe you believe that it could be done in a better way. And you know what? You may be right. And that's hard in those circumstances. I'm not telling you that it is easy. Oftentimes, you do actually know better, probably many times, I'll even say most times, you probably do know better than your husband. But submission for you is going to be trying to figure out how to honor your husband's leadership, no matter what the situation is. That you need to offer your counsel to your husband and make sure that he has all the wisdom he can glean from you to make decisions. But you also need to offer him your patience and your support, even when it's difficult for you because you disagree. Let's move on to what Paul then says about the husbands. And in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul commands husbands to display the ultimate Christian virtue towards their wives. When he says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. While a wife's responsibility is to submit to her husband, it's the husband's responsibility to love his wife. And as you look at these two commandments, I have to think that the reason why a woman is told of all the things, there's many things that, that she could have been told in this passage to do. One thing that she is told to do is submit. And the one thing that he is told to do, although there's many different things that he could have been told by Paul to do, the one thing that he is told to do is to love. And I can't help but think that maybe the reason is, is because this is the two areas, or the one area specifically to each gender, that each one has a difficulty with. That women sometimes are challenged with submitting. But let's face it, us men are challenged with loving the way that we ought to, loving our wives. Love in this text is not just a state of mind on the husband part. That love that is talked about here issues forth in certain kinds of behaviors towards his wife. And I think we can summarize the, these behaviors in three words. Leadership, protection, and provision. Husbands, you are to love your wife by leading her, by protecting her, and providing for her. Now, we've already seen that leadership assignment in verse 23 where we read that the husband is the head of the wife. But I think we see the protection and provision that is implied down in verses 28 and 29. Notice this. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. There's a self-protection that is natural. And I believe what he's talking about here is protection of your wife. Verse 29, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but notice he nourishes it and cherishes it. There is that provision just as Christ also, again, does for the church. And then when you're at home and you're sitting down, all of a sudden you start to feel this pain in your stomach and it's grumbling. And all of a sudden you recognize that you've not eaten for a long time. Do you have to be talked into going and getting something out of the refrigerator? To eating something? No. When you're hungry, you eat. You provide for yourself instinctively. It's not something you have to force yourself to do. You know it's a need, and so you do it. And so with your wife, you lead her, and you give her protection and provision in a way that is instinctive. We protect ourselves, don't we? Something's flying towards us. We put up our hands, and we protect ourselves. It's only natural. We provide for ourselves. The same way we ought to do that for the one whom we become one flesh. You don't have to be told you just do it because you're caring for her like you would your own body. That's the love modeled on Christ's love for the church. Which means that first of all, that husband's love needs to be sacrificial. Which is really the point of verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Notice and gave himself up for her. Husbands, your headship in the home doesn't exist so that you can put your desires, your needs above everyone else. 
Understand that you're not the leadership as a dictator that sits there and everyone else just serves you. It's not that way at all. Your headship exists so that you can give yourself up for your wife just as Christ gave himself up for the church. In Philippians chapter 2, he tells us that our interest, that we're not to look out for our own interest of ourselves, but for the interest of others in verse 4. But he goes on to say in verse 5, have this attitude, the attitude that he's just described, that, that one that doesn't look out for your own interest, but for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which, by the way, he says, was in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be hold on to, to take an advantage of, but emptied himself. Take it on the form of a bondservant. Being found in the likeness of men, he was obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Understand that Jesus is God. He enjoyed all the glories of God in heaven, and yet it says he emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? There's been a lot of debate over that over the years. What did he empty himself of? It wasn't his deity that he emptied himself of. He emptied himself of himself. He gave up himself. He humbled himself. He was willing to give up anything for us. And that's what he did on the cross, is it not? Even the, to the point of death. Not only did Jesus come to this earth and live humbly, but he died. And not only did he die, he died the most humiliating death. He died sacrificially and lovingly for us. And so, husbands, when it says that we are to, willing to give ourselves up, we are to empty ourselves for our wives. I don't doubt that there's a single husband in this room who would not give his life for his wife. Someone's breaking into your house, you would take the bullet for your wife. You would jump out in front of the highway to save your wife. You would give up your life for her. And that's great. But it's much more than that. It's giving up yourself. We wouldn't have a trouble laying down our lives, but would we have trouble giving up our desires, our golf game, our day off, something that we enjoy for our wives? That means that being the leader, provider, and protector sometimes is going to be hard. You know, there's going to be some times that you're going to have some conflicts with your wives. There are going to be times in your marriage where the conflict is her fault. Clearly, in your mind, it's her fault. And you're going to feel like disengaging emotionally from your wife. You're going to feel like walking away and having nothing to do with it and having nothing to do with her until she comes and says sorry. But as the leader of your home, you cannot do that. You don't get to perform a passive-aggressive sulk until your wife swallows her pride and comes to you and make amends. You are the leader. And so that means that you are leading the charge for reconciliation when there is a conflict. Even when you believe it is her fault, it is your job to, to, to reconcile. You get to treat your wife just like Jesus does all sinners. Did Jesus wait for you to become repentant and deserving before He drew near to you, before He laid down His life for you? Did Jesus lead in your reconciliation, or did you do that? You know the answer. Jesus did everything to win you, and you must do everything to win your wife. It's your responsibility. You're the leader. And you might say, well, you don't understand. I'm really mad at her. If that's the case, you put away your anger, you put away your bride, and you obey Jesus. You might say, well, I'm not that very good of a communicator. Then you need to get better at communicating, and you need to lead your wife to do what God has commanded you to do, to change. You take the initiative, and you model tenderness and mercy and love and forgiveness and everything else she needs to make submitting to you a joy for her. What it also means is that we must lead unconditionally. Jesus led, loved us unconditionally. He loves us unconditionally as the church. Jesus didn't have any illusions as to who we are. He knew our faults and He loved us in spite of them. He didn't wait until we attained some standard. He loved us even as we were as we sought to move forward. 
And in the same way, brethren, men are to love their wives for who they are, not for who you want them to be. Now, when you're dating, you get that choice, right? And you, you can break up with your girlfriend if you see that she's probably not going to be a good wife for me. But once you're married, this is the woman you've committed yourself to. And she may never change, but you love her unconditionally. We are to love them even when they don't look the same way they looked when we said, I do. We are to love them even if they don't treat us the way that we ought to be treated. We're to love them even when they have done wrong. And I believe that's why in Colossians, in the similar account of this in Colossians 3 verse 19, Paul says, husbands, love your wives. And notice, don't be embittered against them. Sometimes they're going to rub us the wrong way but we don't allow that bitterness to grow in our hearts. We love them unconditionally. And you might say, well, Jonathan, that's hard. Yes, it is hard. But no one ever said being a leader is easy. But Jesus blazed the trail for us. And you don't have to do anything harder than what Jesus did in loving us as sinners. I'm sure dying on the cross was hard. If Jesus died on the cross for us, certainly we can love our wives unconditionally. So you follow Jesus sacrificially. You follow them you, you love your wives unconditionally. How, how do you do that? The purpose for this kind of sacrificial love, I think, is clear. The reason why we do these things. In verse 26, reading on, the reason that we love our wives this way is so that He might sanctify her having Jesus might sanctify her, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Notice that Jesus died sacrificially and unconditionally. He gave Himself up for His bride with a purpose for her in His mind. He wanted to sanctify her in the present, that's verse 26, but perfect her for the last day in the future, verse 27. In other words, Jesus has His bride's total spiritual renewal in mind as He initiated reconciliation. Husbands, do your does your love for your wife have a purpose? Jesus did. Are, are you self-consciously calculating how you can stimulate your wife to love and good deeds? Or are you trying to do the best that you can to sanctify her now presently? And how can you encourage her to be more and more Christ-like until the last day where you can present her to God as someone who has no spot or wrinkle or any such thing? To sanctify her in the present and present her to our Father in the future. If you don't have your wife's sanctification and perfection in mind, then you're not loving her as Christ loves His bride. And I think that's why Paul goes on to say in the next verse, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. That he who loves his own wife loves himself. Again, a husband's care for his wife must be instinctive. It must be intuitive just as he cares for himself. And because you are one flesh with her, her hurts and her desires, and her needs, and her wants, and her dreams are your hurts, and your desires, and your needs, and your wants, and your dreams. And not only must we love our wives sacrificially and unconditionally, but also I believe the principle here as Jesus loved the church, that He loved the church personally. Our wives are to be seen as such a part of us that caring for her is caring for his own self. Notice again, he says that you're to love your own wife. It's personal. And I think sometimes we have some generalizations, and I even do myself, and I've even done it this evening, about wives. That wives are a certain way in general. That women are a certain way in general. And men are a certain way in general. And, and that is true. There is a lot of truth to that. But you also need to understand that husbands, that each woman is specifically and individually different. And that what sometimes we might say generally about women may not be true about your wife necessarily. 
And that is why it is so important then that we come to know our own wives. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, Peter says, You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she's a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. We've got to come to live with our wives in an understanding way. Now, thankfully, that doesn't mean we have to understand our wives, okay? Because we will never understand our wives. So you're okay there. But we have to live in an understanding way. My own wife, not someone else's wife. So what may be true about someone else's wife may not be true about my own wife. And so learning early on in marriage, I, I had no idea why all of a sudden she'd just start crying, and it made no sense at all and followed out by laughter. And sometimes that laughter turned into crying, and I'm left, what's going on? What did I do? But I figured that out now. I know when she starts laughing really hard, wait, hold on, the tears are coming. I'm just going to hold back, and I'm going to hold her for just a moment. And sometimes, sometimes when Alina says yes, she really means no. You, but I know those circumstances. It took a while for me to figure out some of those circumstances, but sometimes she says no, but she really means yes. I just want you to figure that out. It's confusing. It really is. And I'm still figuring this out after 26 years of marriage. But I've learned what she likes. I learned when flowers are the right thing and when they're not the right thing, and, and chocolates are and chocolates aren't, those types of things. But we have to take the time to get to know our wives personally better to see how they work. See what her reaction gives, what she likes, and it takes time. So don't give up. So husbands are to love their wives. And this is more than an emotional feeling, which is a good thing because we don't do the emotional thing very well, do we? Instead, love as it's used in the Bible is agape. It is a desire for the well-being of the others. That it is expressed in words and in actions. You see, Jesus wasn't just infatuated with the church. Jesus just didn't have giddy feelings for his bride. And, and that's not what Jesus desires for us to have with our bride. Instead, Jesus had the supreme desire for the well-being of his bride, the church. And therefore, he did something about it. And likewise, our love for our wives will be manifested in actions towards them. So let me get more concrete. What kind of things can men do to show love for their wives? Just as I gave some suggestions to the women, let me give some suggestions to the men as well. I suggest that you look for ways to demonstrate how you honor your wife. Remember in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7, we are to show honor to her as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Generally speaking, what that means, men, is that we don't drool over other women. In fact, one of the most dishonoring things that you can do to your wife is to look at other women in ways that you should not be looking at her. In fact, not, not talk about other women and how good of a cook they are compared to your wife. It's never a good thing. It's not honorable to say, uh, she is such a great, better cook. Why, when will you learn to be able to cook like her? Certainly not insulting her. Instead, we should take her hand in a crowded place and show her that we're proud to be like her. Alina refers to this as watering her. She's kind of like watering, like a water in a plant, that you make her grow in that way by showing her honor. Now, that may not be the thing your wife wants, but you come to honor her in that way. It, it means talking about her strengths rather than her weaknesses, especially to other people. And it means talking about how great our life is because of our spouse rather than referring to her as the old ball and chain. I mean, do you realize how we dishonor our wife when we come up to someone who's about to get married and we say to them, you have my regrets? Or, or somebody who is single before they get married and we come to them and we say, enjoy your freedom now because it gets worse down the road. How dishonoring is that to your spouse? Do you see how this makes your wife sound? Let me suggest to you that if we're going to love our wives, we need to seek to show tenderness rather than give them advice. And this is tough for us men. Uh, we want to solve problems. To us, it's like a logic game. It, it, it's just like something that we want to fix. There, there, there's some noise under the hood of our car, so we want to figure this out. We want to solve this. She doesn't want things to be solved all the time. Sometimes she has a problem and she's crying, and she doesn't know why she's crying. 
She just wants you to listen. She just wants you to hold her. We want to fix things. She wants to be held. Some men have a hard time doing that. But we do it anyway because we love our wives. We need to notice and, and comment on the things that she does to enrich your life. Thank you for the good meal. Notice how nice the house looks when you come home. Usually we comment on how bad the house looks if we notice that when it's a disaster. And that sounds like a scolding. And we don't like to be scolding, neither do they. Give your wife quality time. And generally this is longer than commercials during the football game or, or halftime. It means sometimes doing the things she wants to do, not because you enjoy it, but because you like spending time with her. It may be going and looking at antiques for whatever reason. You won't enjoy it, but you enjoy being with her and you enjoy honoring her in that way. So find out what her interests are and share in some of those interests. It may be that we have to admit when we're wrong. I know it doesn't happen much, <laughs> but it helps your relationship. Ask her opinion and value what she says. And when she does give your opinion, don't immediately shut it down. And be thoughtful and gentle to her relatives. You show love for her when you show love for her, her family. Stop calling the in-laws the outlaws. And pitch in and help around the house and don't expect a gold medal when you do that. Pray with her and for her. When's the last time you sat down and prayed with your wife? Let me suggest to you there's nothing greater you can do for your marriage as leader of your home than to sit down and pray with your wife about things that are going on about your own marriage. And I'm not just saying just before meals, that's great. But take some time to pray with your wife. You will never love your bride as Christ loves his bride if you're indifferent toward your spouse. And I want to warn you that apathy and coldness can creep into a marriage after months and even years and decades of passivity toward your marriage. I love the passage in Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And the way I understand, there's many different interpretations of the book of Song of Solomon. But in Song of Solomon, I believe chapter 2 is still the courting phase between Solomon and the Shunammite woman. And it appears that the Shunammite woman is in her vineyard and looking at some of her crops that are about to come in. And, and Solomon comes up to visit her. And she says in verse 15, catch the little foxes for us. The, the little foxes that are running through the vineyard while our vineyards are in blossom. Now, the part of this is sort of this damsel in distress. Oh, Solomon, please save me from the, from the foxes that are coming in here. And he gets to come in there and take these foxes out and begins to be the hero. But I think there's something deeper that's going on in their courting relationship. That he's saying all of these things that are getting in between us, all these things that seek to invade our relationship, get those out of here because they'll tear us apart. And if that's so in the courting relationship, how much more so in the marriage relationship? Brethren, I want you to understand that there are going to be so many little foxes that try to come in your marriages, that try to tear you apart, that try to rip up the vineyards and eat all the little grapes of your marriage. And over time, if you allow that to happen, your vineyard will be bare. And you'll look back over the last 10 years and say, how did we get so far apart? But men, it is our responsibility not to allow these little foxes to survive in our vineyards. You know, marriage is not for the lazy. It takes effort. And the proverb writer in Proverbs 24 says that I pass by a field of the sluggard and by the vineyard of the man lacking sense. And behold, it was completely overgrown with thistles. Its surface was covered with nettles and its stone wall was broken down. Can you imagine it going by in the summertime and seeing someone's garden out there that they planted in the spring and it looks beautiful, but by the end of the summer, it's just weeds. And they didn't get the vegetables in. It's just grown up. And you said, well, that that's... A lazy person right there. How could they allow this to happen? But let me tell you, that's our marriages many times. That, that, that we get lazy and we don't want to work to, 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 to make the marriage work. And all these thistles and all these weeds grow up. And before we know it, we're choked out. Husbands, God has called you to lead. And that means that every single day you have to take, get up, take the initiative and cultivate your vineyard. And if you don't, one day you're going to wake up with these thistles and briars all over your garden, and it's your fault. 
and it will be devastating to your wife, your children, and to you, and it will bring reproach on the gospel. Being the head is a grave responsibility, but it brings glory to God. But now let's draw all this teaching on the roles of marriage back to the main point of the passage here in Ephesians chapter 5. Throughout this passage, Paul draws marriage back to Christ and the church. And that's again what he does here in verse 29 and 30. He said, For no one ever hated his own flesh, as he's talking about love, husbands loving your wives, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Now, I want you to know something very unique here as we go into verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, this is a quotation, obviously, from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. But I want you to notice the beginning of this verse. That Paul doesn't introduce this quotation with something like, as it is written, or the Scripture says which is something that Paul does quite a bit, actually, not every single time. But without introduction, he just simply quotes this verse. Now, why? Why does he do it differently here? I'm not sure I know the answer for sure, but here's a suggestion. I think he does it because he wants the first phrase here, for this reason, to have its real connective force. Why does a man leave his father and mother and join himself to wife? Why does marriage exist in the world? Why is it that this old, age-old institution that cuts across all cultures, all times, all religious groups, that one man and one woman should come together for, for life? Why does marriage exist? For this cause, he says. And that phrase, for this reason, points us back to the previous two verses, verses 29 and 30, that that Christ nourishes and cherishes His church in verse 30, and we are members of His body. For this reason, for that reason, marriage exists upon this earth. Marriage exists to tell the story about Jesus and His marriage to the bride. That's the whole point of marriage. And Paul explains in verse 32, this mystery is great because I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. It's a profound mystery. And here's the mystery, that from the very beginning, God intended marriage to be a depiction of the gospel. For this reason, people get married. To demonstrate to the world that Christ loves and cherishes His bride. Marriage exists to manifest the glory of Christ's redemptive love for His, for his bride. Isn't that amazing to think about? That God, from the beginning of creation, formed this institution to be an illustration to the world many, many years later about Christ and the church. But I want to make this more personal. And what that means is, is that your marriage exists to display to the world the glory of Christ's redemption of His bride. Husbands, you are to love your bride in such a way that people can see the love of Christ for the church. Do the people you work with see the love Christ has for the church in how you talk about your wife? Do the people in your neighborhood know that by the way you treat your wife, this is how Christ loved the church? Do your do your do, do the strangers you run into in the community see you and say, or at least can come to the conclusion that this is how Christ loves the church? Here's an even more pointed question. Does your wife see that this is how Christ loves the church? And wives, you are to submit to your husbands in such a way that the world can see the loveliness of Christ in the obedience of His bride. You see, we are Christ's flesh and blood by covenant. And we belong to our beloved and He belongs to us. And our marriages exist to draw attention to that reality. So what does it say then when we're not the husband and wives that we ought to be? When the world sees us arguing and snipping at one another and being sarcastic and derogatory, when they hear us talk about other women or when we talk down about our husbands, it's not glorifying to God. 
There are many of that doing, many in the world who are doing that sort of thing. Let us not join in with them. So why is, do you see how God's glory is at stake in your submission? And husbands, do you see how God's glory is at stake in your love for your wife? And to everyone, do you see how God's glory is at stake in our marriages? Our testimony to the world can consist in large part of how our marriages are. We take marriage seriously because God takes it seriously. The world doesn't take marriage seriously at all. And when a marriage falls apart, it says something blasphemous about the gospel. It doesn't even have to fall apart completely. It may be that you stay married and you're under the same roof, but it's fallen apart inside your house. We need to repair it. And that's why we care so much. That's why we spend time preaching this from the pulpit. That's why the elders no doubt do here and teach that, and the preacher does as well. Marriage is hard. You won't be able to do it on your own, but God can do it. God can bring you to the resources that you need to be faithful to the role that God has called you to be in marriage. But I don't believe you're going to get there if you can't see the end from the beginning, if you can't see God's purpose for marriage. Marriage is not a personal lifestyle choice. Marriage is about the glory of God and whether or not people are going to see the glory of God in the world. Does your marriage display the gospel to the world? The Bible says that it should. But maybe even more personally this evening, does your life send a message to the world? It may be that you are the world's only Bible that they will ever see. It is your example that will show the light of Jesus Christ. How are you living that? This evening, if you've not been living the way that you ought to, maybe your marriage is not what it needs to be. You repent to your spouse and you work on that today. May, and, and you pray to God and, and, and ask for His forgiveness. Maybe it's of a public nature. Maybe there's some sin in your life that maybe doesn't even have to do with your marriage. Uh, maybe there's something that you've gone amiss and you need to turn back to the Lord tonight. Do that. It may be that you've never become a child of God. We encourage you to, to come this evening to the Lord. Trust in Him the one who, who died on the cross for your sins so that you didn't have to. Repent of your sins this evening. Be immersed in water to have your sins washed away and continue to live a life that pleases the Lord from this time forward. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation anyway, why don't you come forward now as we stand as we sing.